Welcome back guys, Tyler here in the Mets office. Today we're going to uh, get into fatigue and recovery a little bit. So um, as we continue with the key knowledge for Unit 3 Area of Study 2, I'm going to talk a little bit about fatiguing mechanisms and recovery today. Now, before we start fatigue, um, excuse my writing, uh, of course a fatigue, basically or we can think about it as a limiting factor. So a fatiguing factor doesn't need to make you feel tired. It is just going to impact your performance. It is going to slow you down um, you're not going to be able to produce energy at the same rate, so it's going to have an impact on our performance. Now, our cause of fatigue is going to depend on um, basically which energy systems are we using, so duration and intensity of events, we're going to have different causes of fatigue. In our really short explosive events, 100 meter sprint, say 200 meter sprint, um, shot put, javelin, those super short explosive events where we're going to have a lot of contribution from ATP PC system, um, our major cause of fatigue are going to be PC depletion. Now, as spoken earlier, we have a really small amount of PC stores in our body, about 10 seconds, let's say. So once that depletes, we're not going to be able to use that ATP PC system as the dominant provider anymore, which means we're going to slow down. We're not going to get our energy at such an explosive rate, so we're going to slow down. That's what I'm talking about. We don't feel tired when we run out of PC stores. We just can't perform at the same level, so that is a cause of fatigue, a limiting factor. The other one, as we break, as our ATP PC system works, we break down our PC, we resynthesize re ATP, it breaks down to give us energy at such a rapid rate. We can get this accumulation of inorganic phosphate, those phosphate molecules that are breaking away. If we have an accumulation of those, we are going to uh, reduce the power of our contractions. So we're not going to be able to contract as powerfully, which again is going to be a limiting factor. That could explain why in the, the last three to four seconds of a, four, of a 100 meter sprint, the athletes may slow down a little bit. Um, all right, recovery, ATP, PC system. Our major cause of fatigue is going to be this PC depletion. In order to replenish our PC stores, we need a passive recovery. This is the only thing that a passive recovery is good for. A passive recovery is going to speed up replenishment of our PC stores. Um, that is because we're going to need oxygen available. So if, if we're trying to keep running and, and being active, we're going to use those oxygen molecules for other things, aerobic energy, um, uh, controlling, uh, get, getting rid of metabolic byproducts, and we're not going to bother using those to resynthesize our PC source. So super, super low intensity, passive recovery is ideal. If we have a passive, if we fully deplete our PC stores, and then we have a passive recovery, in a 30 second passive recovery, we're going to have 70% replenishment of our PC stores. It's pretty good. In a three minute passive recovery, 98% of those PC stores are replenished, and it could be up to 10 minutes for 100% PC store replenishment. As we go a bit longer, so we get into, let's say a 400 meter sprint, a one minute max effort, team sports that have lots of explosive efforts in them, we're gonna be looking at this anaerobic glycolysis system. Remember, anaerobic glycolysis means we're breaking down glycogen as a fuel without oxygen present. And when we do that, we have an accumulation of metabolic byproducts. If we get asked for the cause of fatigue from our anaerobic glycolysis system, we just need to simply be able to say an accumulation of metabolic byproducts. Good, now I'm gonna break that down a bit further. Um, be careful, if you start talking about this in more depth, you really um, open up your, you, the ways you can make a mistake. So think, an accumulation of metabolic byproducts, good. But I'm gonna explain that it might help you to understand. Byproduct from our anaerobic glycolysis system is lactic acid. Right, lactic acid is made up of lactate and hydrogen ions. It is the hydrogen ions that are causing fatigue. So yes, this, we can say this metabolic byproduct causes fatigue. If we break it right down, it is the hydrogen ions that cause fatigue. Now the way that happens, uh, our blood pH should be 7.35 to 7.45. That is our normal good blood pH range. Hydrogen ions are acidic. They have a low pH. So when we start having hydrogen ions accumulating in our blood, that pH starts to come down, and that becomes a problem. When it gets down to that lower range or outside that ideal range, we don't function properly. Now what it's actually having an impact on, so we get lower blood pH, which is called blood muscle acidosis, lower pH, we become acidic. Our glycolytic enzyme, the enzyme responsible for breaking down the glycogen, it, its function is inhibited. It cannot work as effectively, and that is gonna slow down the rate of our contraction. So we have to contract, relax, contract, relax. That relaxation phase takes longer, which is gonna be longer till we can contract again, which is gonna show in less power being able to produce. Um, we'll go back though, we just wanna know an accumulation of metabolic byproducts is going to cause fatigue. Now, if that is our major cause of fatigue, how are we gonna recover? 
but we need to get those byproducts out of the system. And to do that, we need oxygen. So we're gonna have to slow down our intensity. We're gonna have to, um, we won't be able to keep sprinting. So to get rid of accumulation of metabolic byproducts, we wanna use an active recovery. An active recovery is best described as completing the same activity at a greatly reduced intensity. So if you've done a rowing race, we would wanna do a very low, low intense row. If you've been in a swimming race, we wanna do a very light swim. Running, we wanna jog or walk. Cycling, a very light cycle. It is important that we do the same activity, if it's possible, in order for that redistribution of blood flow. We need that, that oxygen that we're gonna bring in to go to the correct muscle groups. What an active recovery is gonna do, the main goal here is we want to extend EPOC. So we've spoken about EPOC before, excess post exercise oxygen consumption. By keeping ourselves moving, our heart rate will start, our ventilation will start. We keep bringing extra oxygen into the body, we take it to those working muscles and we can use that oxygen to get rid of this byproduct. Now, what happens? Lactate. What happens with lactate is we introduce oxygen and we go through gluconeogenesis, right? A big complex procedure you don't need to know about. But when we have that lactate and we introduce oxygen, it is going to turn back into a glucose molecule in the blood, which we can then use as fuel. So that's good. That's not a bad thing. Hydrogen ions, these are the bad ones. These are the ones we really want to get out of our system. We've all heard H2O, two hydrogen molecules and an oxygen molecule make water. So those oxygen molecules we're bringing in, we're gonna combine those with the hydrogen, we're gonna turn that into water, and we can breathe it out as condensation or use it in the body. So we need that oxygen. That is why we have this epoch. That is why our oxygen supply will stay up while we have that accumulation of metabolic byproducts to clear it out. The active recovery helps with that. The other thing is, cool is to help with venous return. Now, the term venous pooling is talking about the blood pooling, gathering in the veins. What happens is our heart pumps, we have good blood pressure in our arteries. By the time that goes all the way around the body, gets into our veins, the blood pressure is dropped. We have lower blood pressure in our veins. So it's harder to return that blood to the heart. Now, if you've ever been on a long haul flight, you might notice that you get off and you might have big fat feet, big ankles. Right? That is due to that low pressure. The blood is just getting stuck down there. Gravity's holding it down at your feet. And with the low pressure, it's hard to get it back up. So what we get, um, we don't want that. If we've got really high metabolic byproducts in our blood and they're stuck down in my legs, well, that's not good. I need it to go up through my heart, through my lungs so that I can get that oxygen in there. So we get it in assistance with venous return through a skeletal muscle pump um, action. So while the leg muscles are contracting, say, that puts greater pressure onto the veins and helps return that blood. So our active recovery is gonna extend EPOC, keep the oxygen coming in for longer, to help clear out those metabolic byproducts and it's gonna help with venous return. We wanna avoid venous pooling through that skeletal muscle pump action. Okay, when we get into longer events, marathons, triathlons, things that are gonna go for, for anywhere really from 15 minutes to multiple hours, we're gonna be using our aerobic energy system. So we may have small accumulation of metabolic byproducts but we wanna be below lip. We can't have those accumulate because that's really gonna be a problem. So the major cause of fatigue is gonna come from this side. Now, the byproducts of our aerobic energy system, water, CO2, and heat, non-fatiguing. Water is good, we like water. We got chemical reactions going on, they produce water. Our body likes water, that's a good thing. Carbon dioxide, we just breathe it out. We control it, it gets created, diffuses back into our blood through the veins, uh, diffuses into the lungs, breathe it back to the atmosphere, that's good, won't cause fatigue. Heat, this is a confusing one. Heat does not cause fatigue because as humans, we are very, very good at thermoregulating. We do that by sweating, redistribution of blood flow. So we send more blood flow to the skin surface. Our blood plasma can then sweat out, which can take heat with it and evaporate. So as long as we can do that, everything's under control and we can just keep going. So what are gonna be some causes of fatigue when we're talking about aerobic type events, long, long events? One is glycogen depletion. If you've heard the term hitting the wall, that is talking about glycogen depletion. We run out of our glycogen stores, meaning we have to now um, re re go back to fats as a fuel source, which means we will slow down. That will slow down our rate of energy production. We need more time, more oxygen to break down fats, meaning we can't perform at the same level. If you've ever hit the wall, you'll know that feeling. It's not very nice. We'd prefer to be breaking down glycogen. So glycogen depletion will be a cause of fatigue. Dehydration will be a cause of fatigue, right? We said heat isn't because of that thermoregulation, but dehydration is. 
what will happen is through thermoregulation we're sweating if it's a long event a marathon we should be drinking water as well but we are likely losing more sweat than we are putting back in so our blood plasma is going that means our blood is getting thicker we're losing our blood plasma the fluid so we've got red blood cells white blood cells and platelets in there and the blood is thickened we have an increased blood viscosity that is going to be harder for your heart to pump. Your heart's going to have to work harder to pump that thicker blood around the body. It's going to be harder to get oxygen into working muscles. It's going to be a cause of fatigue. Now, an increase in core body temperature. Now, this sort of comes as a result of this. As we start to run out of our blood plasma, our blood starts to thicken, we will probably start to reduce our rate of sweating because we're not going to, what will happen if we lose too much blood plasma, blood gets thicker, 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 eventually it will get so thick, your heart won't be able to pump it and you put yourself at risk of having a, a heart attack, cardiac arrest, some sort of cardiac event. So we start to slow down our rate of dehydration so that we, we're trying to avoid getting to that really serious point. Now, if we're not, sorry, we slow down our rate of sweating. That's what I meant to say. Now, if we're not sweating as much, we're not controlling our core body temperature as much, and our core body temperature is going to start to go up. Right, 37 degrees are okay. Everything can function normally. As we start to get 38, 39, 40, things don't function as well. Enzymes don't work. Cells don't function effectively. They're not in their ideal environment. It's going to start to cause us fatigue. Now, this can get very, very serious. We can get ourselves to a point where we stop sweating. Right, we can see athletes running marathons in hot conditions, doing Ironman triathlons in hot conditions, and they just stop sweating. Now, think about running 40 degrees on the asphalt, it's really hot, and you don't sweat. It's a really weird sensation. The reason is our bodies realize that if we keep sweating, our blood will get so thick, we may uh, have a heart attack. We better stop sweating. 70% of our cooling is coming from that thermoregulation. So, we lose that and our core body temperature goes up really quickly. If that reaches 43, we will die, we'll have complete cellular um, shutdown. So we're not gonna let that happen. So we start to get to this point, central fatigue, where our central nervous system is starting to take control. We're gonna stop sending those messages we need to our muscles. You may have seen athletes at the end of big events look a bit um, unsteady, a bit uncoordinated, perhaps they even collapse, perhaps they even faint. That is all part of this, this all leads to one thing. Our body's trying to protect it, itself. It's trying not to get to that 43 degree mark where we may die and our central system starts to take over. We might faint uh, as, at an extreme to try and keep that under control. If you go to our YouTube channel um, or you can go up through the link in our bio, you'll find in there, there's a good video Luke did breaking down. Callum Hawkins, a Scottish marathon runner, was leading at the Commonwealth Games on the Gold Coast two years ago um, and then went through this sort of situation with that multifactorial fatigue, the central fatigue started to take over and he collapsed not too far from the end. So how are we going to recover from these types of fatigue? How do we recover from glycogen depletion? We need to refuel. So immediately post event we want some sort of high GI, carbohydrate meal, lollies, bananas, things like that where we can quickly replenish our muscle glycogen stores. We want that to happen quickly. Later on, we're going to get a lower GI meal so we can keep sort of drip feeding that in and some protein to help with our... All right, sorry. All right, sorry about that. Um, we're back. So what we say, how do we recover uh, from glycogen depletion? We need to uh, refuel. So high GI immediately stayed after the event, quickly replenish those muscle glycogen stores. And then we're going to go for more of a low GI type meal to drip feed that, keep on um, topping those stores up, and some protein if we need for our muscle recovery. Um, and then that dehydration, body temperature, we want to hydrate. So water. The rule is if we lose, as an example, four kilograms of body weight in an event, that would relate to four liters of water. We want to put in 1.5 times that amount back up. So um, if we've lost four kilograms, we're going to want to drink six liters to try and get back to where we were because we're not going to absorb all of that. Some of that is going to get passed through. Uh, like I said, if you jump on YouTube, you'll be able to see a good video on multifactorial fatigue that will look into that. Um, when you're doing these questions, think about what is the cause of fatigue in the event? If it's a short explosive event, PC sore depletion. Uh, if it's a really high intensity event for a bit longer, we're going to look at this accumulation of metabolic byproducts, really long events, glycogen depletion, dehydration, uh, increased core body temperature, and then think about how are we going to counter those things? What do we do to recover from those? All right, any questions, throw those in. We'll get to those on Friday. Thanks for watching.